All right, so in my last video on this channel, uh, we spent some time making this really cool drop down that used Radix and Framer Motion. We ended up with this cool menu component uh, with a little bit of animation here and uh, an API that looked something like this. So uh, while, we, while what we ended up with was kind of maximally flexible and we used it to pull off just the effect that we wanted, some folks in the comments asked about uh, how you would go about making this reusable. So I thought it'd be fun in this video to just kind of uh, take a swing at refactoring this. I kind of did a quick run through of this a few days ago, but purposefully gave myself some space because I wanted to show you how I would go about refactoring this, making it into something that I would reuse across an app, maybe share with my team to enforce some consistency, but make it a lot easier to use than copying and pasting uh, this kind of big mess that we ended up here. And um, I just kind of wanted to do this more or less in real time, share my thinking along the way, and just show you exactly the steps that I take when I do this sort of refactoring instead of kind of preparing something uh, that's a bit more uh, planned out ahead of time. Because, you know, a lot of refactoring, there's kind of an art to it, and um, it's not always a linear path. There's kind of this circuitous route that we go through kind of extracting things, identifying new abstractions where the boundary should be. So I thought that would be a fun video to make. So let's go ahead and take a look at the code and kind of see where we would get started with this. And so if, if you didn't see my last video, this is the menu that we have. And we can see that all the code for this menu is right here in app.tsx. We are directly importing from both Radix and Framer Motion. We have some use effects, some functions, some state. And uh, if you look at this UI right here and think about what the business logic is, what's actually relevant to this particular app, well, you might say that we have kind of this button with the Apple logo, and then we actually have the menu items themselves, one, two, and three, which are all right here. And then the logic for what those things do on select right here and right here, that's actually setting some state within the app. And then this guy is gonna go ahead and set off an alert. But as far as uh, making this reusable, the first thing that I would do is basically work from the outside in. So whenever I'm refactoring a component, trying to make something basically have a smaller public interface, something that would be nice to use, I wanna think about it from the API first. So if I were importing a dropdown and this was an Acme code base, what would I want the API to be? And so let's just take a look at the code here. And kind of right above this, uh, let's just close these and take a look. You know, we have a lot of details here about wiring this up. I think in our case, uh, if we were going for something kind of truly reusable, we'd want to import a dropdown menu. We'd want to do something like render a dropdown menu dot button. And uh, this is where we would drop our little Apple sign. And then right here, we would have something like a dropdown menu dot menu. And uh, this would be the part where we actually put in, you know, the logic of our items. So this might be a menu item, a menu item, and a menu item. So I think we would have something like a menu item with item one, two, and three. And uh, then we go ahead and close this dropdown menu. Something like this, uh, just looking at the API. And then again, we also uh, want the logic, right? Because uh, we want our app developers to be able to render a menu item and then connect some behavior to it. And I think basically the API that we get from Radix with on select is a, a pretty good one. So maybe uh, we would come here and go ahead and add an on select, something like this. And so this looks like a pretty good API. Uh, this would make it really easy to use. You can see there's not a lot of options here to customize the styling. So if we wanted, again, folks to be able to render this everywhere in their app, keep it consistent, this is a good way to go. So let's go ahead and implement this. And the way I like to do this is from the outside in. So we're gonna start up here with a drop down menu, and we basically want it to render all of this right here. So let's go ahead and open our sidebar, and we'll just create our own drop down component. Export default function dropdown. And we just want to return all of this code right here. Now we're going to want to go ahead and grab our Radix import up here. 
and we see we're going to need our open state as well. So uh, let's go ahead and grab this. And we can kind of see uh, we're going to want children in here. So we can just throw that in here while we're here. So uh, let's go ahead and comment out kind of our old root. And I'm just going to comment these out because they don't exist yet. Let's go ahead and import this. We don't want this from Radix anymore. We actually want this from our local project right here. And uh, this is actually called dropdown. So let's just change the root element to be dropdown. Now we get this. And uh, now we can see kind of our new dropdown is starting to be rendered. And so the next thing we want to do is render this button. So let's go ahead and uncomment all of this. And we'll comment out the menu for now. And we want this component to be exposed so we can render the button. So let's go ahead and find all of the button code. Uh, if we go ahead and uncomment this just to take a look, again, we have kind of our root our button, and then our menu is going to be all of this stuff right here. That's what corresponds to this. But the button is just this trigger. So we can grab this. Let's collapse this and comment it out again. And uh, what we want to do here is create a new function called drop down button. And this is where we're going to return kind of uh, the drop down menu trigger we had before. Go ahead and replace this with children. We know we're going to want to customize that. And uh, a cool little trick uh, you can use to kind of have this sort of API so that uh, folks in your project, you know, can just import dropdown from your project and then kind of call these related uh, components directly off of it using this dot syntax is to just go ahead and uh, create the function, the component right here, and then attach it to kind of our main export up here. So we can say dropdown dot button. That's the kind of public API we want is just equal to our dropdown button this local component right here. And uh, because functions are objects and can have properties in JavaScript, uh, this is gonna work just fine. Now, TypeScript is telling us dropdown menu doesn't exist because it doesn't. Uh, we're using dropdown. And yeah, I, I think dropdown makes more sense than what we started with. We had dropdown menu as a root and then menu.button and then menu.menu, menu.menu item. I think uh, dropdown as kind of a root um, component name right here is, is better. So go ahead and just change this. So this is again, this is kind of the final API we want to end up with, which looks really clean. But uh, if we save this, uh, we see our button is actually working. And you know, we can go ahead and customize this. It works just fine. And if we look at what it's rendering, then it should be rendering this drop down menu dot trigger from radix dot menu right here. And we can just take a look if we open the inspector and take a look at this button. Indeed, it looks like Radix is doing its thing. It's adding data state and type button and all this functionality. So uh, this seems to be working just fine so far. Okay, and so again, this is kind of how I do this. I kind of go from the outside in, commenting out all the inside and just getting one component working, starting from the root, going inside. I think this is the easiest way to do this sort of thing. And so uh, next is the menu. And again, in the same idea, of starting from the outside in, we're not going to go ahead and do all of this. We're just going to do the menu. So we'll comment out all these menu items. And our next step is to just get this menu rendering. So uh, let's actually start just by creating a function drop down menu like this. We can return null. And uh, this would be kind of like a more step by step way to do it. Drop down dot menu should be drop down menu. This should get the app working again because we're exposing this on a dot menu. Uh, we actually have an error here. It looks like a drop down menu uh, has already been declared. And uh, this is because we have drop down menu, this local component and drop down menu right here from Radix. So what I'm gonna do here to avoid collisions and just to clear this up is to go ahead and rename this to Radix drop down menu. And this is something I like to do, you know, even though the guides from Radix will tell you to call it drop down menu, of course, you can call it whatever you want. And from the perspective of our consumer, right, our consumer that is rendering our kind of local Acme drop down or the drop down that's in your design system, they don't actually know that this is implemented with Radix. So Radix has become an implementation detail. In theory, it could be swapped out with another headless UI library. Uh, but 
you, you want your app developers to be thinking that a dropdown is, is what's in your design system. And so from that perspective, when actually implementing these design system components, I like to call these, if I run into a conflict like this, because it just clears it up, this is the Radix dropdown. That's when we're using the Radix APIs. And so uh, that should solve that. And uh, it looks like it renamed our local one right here. So let's just go ahead and call this dropdown menu and uh, make sure this guy down here is dropdown menu as well. So uh, if we refresh, looks like our app is rendering again. And now instead of having our local menu just return null, let's go ahead and, and uncomment this again, the original code, expand it. And let's take a look at menu. So you can see the structure of the component tree here is uh, the same uh, between these two APIs. And so far, we've kind of had a one-to-one -one mapping from component to component, right? Our dropdown renders this single element, and then our button renders kind of this single element. But now we have this third component, which we want to use to encapsulate a lot of these details. I'm going to go ahead and close the sidebar just so we have some more room. And uh, the details conceptually start right here. So if we were to collapse this animate presence, now you can kind of squint your eyes and see the same structure between uh, these two chunks of code. And so conceptually, our dropdown menu really starts with this animate presence and all of this logic right here. So let's just take a look. We render an animate presence. We conditionally uh, render the rest of the content if the dropdown is open. Then we use uh, a portal. And the portal is, again, kind of a detail of Radix, which helps us uh, position it correctly in the DOM. And then we render this dropdown menu.content. So far, we still have kind of this single tree going down. We don't have multiple siblings or anything like that. And then we render our motion div. This is from Framer Motion, it controls our animations. And then we render our items. And here's the first time where we kind of have some sibling components, and those are gonna correspond pretty well to our menu items right here. So conceptually, our dropdown menu is actually going to render all of this. So let's go ahead and just copy all of this. And we'll go ahead and comment this out again. And I'm gonna come over here and return all of that code. So uh, we're gonna have to fix some imports here. Let's go ahead and get animate presence. Let's change these to be uh, the Radix dropdown menu since kind of we're in this new file here, Radix. We'll go ahead and import motion div. And uh, let's just go kind of in order here just so we don't lose, our, lose track of our work. For the first open, let's just go ahead and make this true for now. We just kind of want to get this rendering so we can get some feedback. We also have this animation controls. Let's come back and see where that came from. That was used right here. We created this in app. So let's grab this. We'll paste it in just like that. Import that. And then uh, if we come down here to our items, these are going to be separate components. So these are going to be children, again, because these are being rendered inside of our menu. So we'll create a new prop, children, just like that. And uh, look at that. With a save, we got our menu back. So that's pretty cool. Seems like that's working. Let's go ahead and take a look at our DOM just to get some feedback. Now we're not toggling open right now. Uh, so if we click this, uh, it looks like we see a little bit of DOM updating, but it's kind of always uh, seems like it's in a closed state. But we also see this Radix popover content, which is the portal and our actual menu, we can kind of see it right there in the DOM, even though it's not rendering any content. So again, I'm just kind of looking for feedback right now as I'm kind of painting and just playing with this refactor uh, to make sure that you know the Radix components are rendering, the frame of motion components are rendering, uh, even though it's not functional right now. But uh, everything seems to look good so far. And uh, let's come back to our caller. And instead of jumping to menu item, let's let's get some of this behavior working because this is really the first time, you know, the button by itself doesn't do anything without a corresponding menu. So everything was kind of working more or less by itself, but now we have a menu and we clearly kind of can't see it. So this is the menu contents. And if we save that, let's just get rid of this ASDF. We're not gonna see this 
again because our dropdown has uh, this open set to true. Now I actually would expect to see this. So let's just uh, come and see if we can find this is the menu contents in our DOM here. This is the menu content. So it looks like it is being rendered, but uh, it has data state closed on it. And uh, that's because we are having some misagreement here with the root, which is starting it out as false. It's never changing it to true. So we basically just need to make sure that this is actually correct and this actually toggles itself. So um, one interesting thing uh, that we're gonna run into with this design with these different components is if we look at how we've laid this out, our root dropdown actually owns the open state. And if you remember from the last video, this is because we needed to make this version of the Radix dropdown menu as kind of a controlled dropdown so that uh, we could use frame or motion to actually animate it. That's what this is all about. But that means that uh, we are responsible for this open state. And it also means that we need to make sure there's a single source of truth for that open state. We couldn't just duplicate this and put it down here because these two are the same uh, component system. They need to uh, agree with each other. But um, how might we get this open state down to this component? And uh, you'll notice there's not an obvious way to pass it as a prop because our dropdown is no longer kind of responsible for rendering the menu. We actually want the caller to render the menu uh, so that they have a little bit of flexibility. You know, this is usually how you see component APIs like this. Uh, a lot of times when I'm making up my own APIs for things like design systems and apps I'm working on or helping teams with, I try to base them off of APIs that I see from open source because they probably ended up like that for a good reason. And so um, there's always this balance of how limited your public interface is versus how flexible you make it. And the more limited you make it, the less you will be able to um, handle use cases that you hadn't thought of at the time that you were authoring this. So you could imagine us actually just passing like menu items in as a prop to drop down and drop down would render the menu itself. We're not going with that API design in this case, but uh, because of that, and because the consumer is rendering the menu here, the question becomes, how do we get this open state from drop down to drop down menu? And we don't want the consumer to have to manage the state themselves as part of the point of this abstraction in the first place is so that we can manage the open state for them. So we wouldn't want them to have to pass an open right here and right here. So the question is if they're rendering dropdown menu, but our dropdown has this internal open state, how can we get that open state down to the dropdown menu, even though kind of they're the ones that rent is rendering that menu out here. And this is a perfect use case for react context. If you've never used it before, it's basically a way to give a component implicit props. And that's exactly the problem that we have right here. So uh, let me show you how cool this is. We're just going to create some context. And this is just local to this file. We can just call this drop down context like that. And then we're going to wrap uh, the root of our drop down in a drop down context. And then this has a dot provider on it right there. We can see TypeScript is telling us. And uh, you might be familiar with providers. You know, sometimes you install libraries and they, they ask you to wrap the root, root of your application in them. That's kind of what we're doing here, except this is just local to our little dropdown. And uh, what we can do is pass in a value of whatever we want. So let's go ahead and pass this open state. That's just gonna be a simple object with a key of open and a value of open like that. We'll just use the shorthand. And now uh, anything inside of this part of our component tree can uh, read into this context and get the current value of open basically as an implicit property that was passed to it. And the way you do that, our button doesn't need it, right? But um, our menu does. So instead of just defining this as true, we wanna get this from the context. The way we do that is to use context. And so we're just gonna pass down, drop down context, and this is gonna give us back whatever is in this uh, value option right here. And so we want the open prop. And now check this out. So now we see this is actually being added and removed from the DOM whenever we click the button. Now we're still not actually seeing the content, but if we search for this, uh, we can see this is right here. Um, it has our CSS classes. Uh, it looks like it has opacity 
zero. And I think um, I'm remembering now this is because uh, we are controlling that menu with some more code back in app. So this is uh, the effect right here. It was watching for changes to the open state and actually running a mount animation. So let's go ahead and copy this. And uh, I think we can throw this, uh, let's see what this is doing. This is taking the controls that were being passed to the div inside of our menu and calling open on them. So now those controls, that's right, we use them right here in drop down menu and we have an open variant. So if we throw that right here, import use effect, now we're seeing the menu and our animation. So this is pretty neat, right? Our drop down menu is reading open from the context. It has an effect that's running an animation with, within itself whenever that open prop changes. Uh, but our consumer didn't have to change anything about their API in order to make that happen. They didn't have to become a controlled version of our drop down. We, we uh, still are controlling the state so from their perspective, it is an uncontrolled component. The state is not something that they control. And uh, I think this is really cool, just how easy, if you've never used context like this on your own, just within a single file, it's just a really nice way to solve this problem. And so uh, it looks like this is working pretty good, like what I see so far. And uh, while we're here, let's go ahead and be good citizens and take care of some of these TypeScript errors. So first, children, these are just props. Let's just make these React nodes just like that. We'll do the same thing right here. And but that takes care of that. Next, we have this, which is create context. Now, create context actually wants us to give it both a default value and um, a generic type. So let's give it a default value. We'll just say open is false. And that might be enough to actually have those types flow through. That's pretty neat. So uh, th this default value is not actually useful for us. I think we could get just pass in an empty object and then describe the type like this open is a Boolean, but then we would need uh, to specify something right here as well. So let's just go back pass in a default type. But in our case, uh, the default doesn't matter. We're always going to be passing a value. Sometimes with context, you can actually uh, give it a meaningful uh, default value and then the provider doesn't need to provide anything new. But in our case, it's providing state. It needs to be tied to this component. So we thread it through context just like this. And um, that looks pretty good so far. We've gotten rid of the red squigglies. And now we're on to the fun part, the last part here, which is the item. So uh, you can see this is kind of the flexibility coming through, right? Uh, if you really wanted to lock people down and never let them render anything different, um, well, we can see that they're able to render something that doesn't look anything like a menu item with this API. But again, we're kind of landing somewhere in the middle. So let's go ahead and uncomment the last section of our component tree. And we see we want a menu item. So we'll come over here. Let's go ahead and define function drop down menu item. We already know that uh, this is gonna take children because these need to be customized from the caller side. And so we'll go ahead and do children, children, react node. And let's go ahead, return children for now. And we'll attach it just like this menu, menu item. So now we should be able to call dropdown.menu item, save that. And look at that, we're seeing item one, two, and three just like that. And um, if we were to find these, well, they're just text right now because we're not actually returning anything. So uh, once again, let's go ahead and collapse all this. We will uncomment just like that so we can see what's going on. And we'll come and see kind of what our items are returning. And it looks like they have a close menu and on select, uh, but we actually had already kind of extracted this item right here, and this is this is where kind of the meat of it is. So let's actually just copy this. I'm just gonna copy this. We're gonna stick it right here. And I'm just gonna rename this basically to drop down menu item. And then we can delete this. 
just like that. And let's start with these arguments right here. So I think from the calling side, we were just passing through close menu, on select, and children. And that's what these arguments are. So children, on select, close menu. And then uh, these items have their own animation controls and they render a dropdown menu.item. But again, this was actually the Radix dropdown. So let's go ahead and change this to Radix dropdown menu. And then we also wanna get uh, sleep right here, just like this. So let's grab that, paste it in there. And now if we refresh, oh, looking pretty good. Okay, getting close. Uh, if we take a look at these, we're gonna see all this nice roll menu item, and that's coming from our Radix dropdown menu item. We see our animations are actually working pretty sweet, uh, with the exception of close menu. So I'm actually gonna start cleaning some of this up over here so we can keep track of the refactor. At this point, I actually think um, we've copied all of this code, I guess with the exception of the on selects uh, from our original. So let's just keep those around a little bit longer. But uh, we can go ahead and comment out this because we've copied this over. We are not using this anymore. We can comment that out. And uh, here is the close menu function. And so this is what we were doing to pass from our root menu into the item again because we wanted to wait once the user clicked an item to blink and then close the menu. So we kind of had to use inversion of control there have the parent pass down a close menu function and then trigger that after the children had after the child item had finished this animation. And so we need to figure out where we're going to put this kind of back in our drop down. So this is using the controls here in the root that were passed to the menu and it's setting the open state to false. So we need access to both the controls and the uh, set open function. Well, we know our controls are right here in the menu. And uh, we can also see that this is kind of where the effect lived as well. So I think it would make sense to put it right here. Let's just see what happens. We have closed menu, we have access to controls, uh, but now we also need access to set open. And so again, uh, this closed menu function needs to call set open. That set open lives in the parent right here. And what we can do is it's the same idea conceptually as passing down the open state. We want to pass down the set open setter uh, down to a child or two, and we can do that using context. So we can just pass this through just like this. We'll add it to context. And so now if we come down to our drop down menu, we can grab set open from our context. And now this async function can go ahead and await the close animation before setting open to false. That took care of that race condition that we saw uh, when we built this in the last video. So now our drop down menu has a hold of this close menu function. And we have these drop down menu items that are being rendered up here. And uh, we already know that they need close menu. And, and we can actually see from our implementation in the first video, these came through as a prop. But again, our consumer now is rendering these and uh, we don't want them to have to thread this close menu function through. This was one of the things that was kind of ugly about the API we ended up with. Close menu was always the same. We just had to get it from the parent down to these item components. Um, and so we had to thread them through like this. But ideally the API would be nice and tidy like this and they wouldn't have to think about that. It would just be an implementation detail. So how can we get close menu from our drop-down menu to our drop-down menu items. Well, we need another context. So this is another case of an implicit prop forwarding to kind of this related component. So let's go ahead and create context. We'll call this drop-down menu context. And our menu will wrap uh, its children inside of this provider. And uh, I actually just like to go ahead and put the provider at the top just because that's usually where you see them. So let's call this drop down menu. And uh, this is actually the context. And we go ahead and render the provider right here. And then we thread anything we want through that any children should have access to. In this case, they need close menu. So we can pass through close menu just like that. 
And now if we come down to our item, let's just check our work, get some feedback because that was kind of a lot and uh, see, we were already getting this error that closed menu is not a function. So let's delete this as an explicit param. Close menu, close menu. Let's use context of drop down menu context and let's get close menu like this and just log it to see if anything is there. And uh, once these render, indeed we see our async function. And look at that, once we click an item, the menu closes. So uh, that's pretty neat. Um, we kind of have two layers of context here. And you might be thinking, well, this is kind of weird. Like, uh, why can't we put this in the root and just have a single context? Well, it's because it uses this controls, which is owned by the menu. So normally, just like in normal React code, you want to rely on passing props uh, down the tree and using events to send things back up. That's kind of this one-way data flow that React really made popular, but is also just a good thing to keep in mind. It's really the React paradigm and it keeps your code a lot easier to understand and maintain in the long run. So when you're thinking about context as implicit prop sharing, you want to think about it the same way. And close menu right here refers to controls, which is within the menu. It's not within the root dropdown. So if we had the close menu function on the root dropdown, how could it get access to the controls that are in a child? You could kind of think of some way to do it, but you want to avoid any kind of funny, like sending things up and storing them in a context on the parent just so they can be sent down further. Um, this is really the best way to do it. And there's an interesting point about composition here. Uh, look at this dropdown. You could imagine having multiple dropdowns, right? The cool thing about context is that it's provided to a subtree of your app with the given value. So if you think about it, right now we only have a single menu that can be closed, right? And that's why we're doing this, just to kind of refresh. We have a menu, we open it, we click an item, and then it closes the menu. So you're like, why won't we just have a closed menu on the root because it should know how to close the menu? Well, what if we had nested dropdowns and I could hover this and show another menu that had its own items? And uh, what if clicking on you know, escape needed to just close uh, that menu? or clicking a button just closes that menu. Now you can kind of see why these things are make sense to keep at the level where the state or the function is owned because you actually would have multiple close menus in that case and you'd only want the items that are children of the nearest ancestor menu to have access to the ability to close the menu uh, for its kind of owner. And so I thought that was an interesting point here. It can seem like, oh, why do we need to create contexts? Um, it seems like there's only one closed menu, but in fact, this function is owned and defined by the menu. You, so you want that to be uh, where the, that context, that implicit threading starts. Conceptually, we're still passing props all the way down. And so uh, let's just go ahead and see what we've got. We've got our menu showing, we've got our animations running, we've got the menu closing. After the animations, we can still hit escape, we can still click outside to close. So all the radix behavior is here. The last part, is that uh, our actual UI is not working. So over here, we've given some on select props with some business logic. Well, we actually didn't copy the business logic over, but in our app, and now we can actually start to comment out the rest of this stuff. Don't need that anymore. But this text right here is actually part of this kind of business logic part of this application, right? It's being rendered way down here in this div. And uh, look at this, we're not using this anymore. So we can go ahead, comment that out, comment that out. And so uh, this should go ahead and set text to clicked item one. And we can do the same thing right here, set text to clicked item two. And then this one, I think we had alert, little smiley face. And if we actually click these, well, it actually works. <laughs> I forgot that these were already wired up, right? Because these are just still normal props being passed in. This still makes sense to have on select be part of our public interface because that's the kind of thing that our consumers would want to customize. Uh, but now 
um, that is being wired to our Radix menu item right here. So all that is still working. We call it the same thing. So it's working just fine. And if we come take a look, our API looks pretty good and the app looks pretty good. All right, let's fix the last few TypeScript errors here. Uh, I think we need set open. Set open is gonna be a function and uh, this doesn't return anything. Whoops, we're still in JavaScript. Um, this takes in a Boolean. So let's actually go ahead and type these using the generic. This takes in an object with open is a Boolean. Set open is, let's see, a function that doesn't return anything and takes in a value, which is a Boolean. Uh, maybe we just need Boolean like that. Uh, clearly not a TypeScript wizard yet. So let's go ahead and just see if this works. Probably an easier way to do this. But um, look at that. Set open is a set state action. Um, and uh, that's making TypeScript happy. I think it's actually accurate as well. So we couldn't use that. We couldn't abuse it. Uh, we'll do the same thing for this. This is going to be just a function. Close menu is function. Whoops, function. And yeah, uh, if I press uh, F8 here, check this out. The next error in our app is all these unused in imports. I'm going to go ahead and organize my imports. And uh, let's delete all this code, including our original starting point. And this is what we're left with. Pretty cool, right? Uh, if we look at this, uh, this has made it a lot easier to reuse this menu, this drop down menu component throughout our application. Anyone who wanted this uh, could just drop this and just worry about their business logic. And of course, there's a million more things you can do to make it, you know, um, allow for multiple menu items or sub menus, all that sort of thing. But I just wanted to go through that because when I'm working on components like this in apps, this is basically how I think about it, right? Uh, you might've heard me say this before, but there's this phrase that's like, uh, make it work, make it right, make it fast. So the, the last video that we did was basically just making it work. And we kind of stopped right there. But if that was going to be a component that goes into a general code base to share with uh, other developers it, that that raw code that we ended up with would be um, hard to make sure that it didn't break over time or it'd be hard to change if it was copied into multiple places right this has a much more restricted public interface it's much more pleasant to use if I'm an app developer but it also lets us change a lot of things about it from in here and this is kind of uh, the drop down that we ended up with and if you look at all this stuff, nothing uh, about Radix and nothing about frame or motion is in here at all. We just get to import dropdown, you know, from a component uh, design system or a UI library that's local to our project, but we don't know anything about how it's implemented. So that's pretty cool. And that's kind of the benefit of doing this sort of thing. Uh, but this is what we ended up with. And uh, I hope you learned a thing or two along the way there. Uh, just to recap, kind of, uh, that's how I like to start to extract these into components is I start with the API first. I think if you take away anything from this video, it's this, and uh, this is true in open source as well. I used to do a lot of open source, um, but it's a really good practice to start with the uh, API first, to start from the outside in. In open source, you might even hear uh, starting with the readme, readme driven development, but it's the same idea. You wanna think, how am I gonna use this dropdown elsewhere? How are my colleagues gonna use this? And what would be the API that I want to be uh, when I actually have to pull a drop down in to some page I'm working on. And so that's what we did. We started with this. And then once we uh, decided that we were happy with it, we went ahead and commented out the children and started with the root ancestor. And we just got this root drop down working. And we did that by creating a drop down in our project, importing it, and then replacing it, um, the, the code that was kind of duplicated with that. And then we slowly went nested in and in. 
And along the way, we got feedback. So that was the kind of process that I like to use all the time when I'm coding. And um, yeah, I thought that would be an interesting thing to see. And now you've ended up with a dropdown that's much more reusable and easy to change in the future. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. If you have any ideas for other videos um, that you'd like me to uh, make, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.